good morning good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in different parts of the world world hepatitis day this is a day where the world's community unite and make sure that their voices are heard to the, all the stakeholders that are taking care of elimination of hepatitis across the world my name is Dr. Jahanzeb Kamal, and I'm your host and the moderator for today's session. Why we are here today? We are here to inform the audience about what is happening in hepatitis, how we can avoid hepatitis, what are the prevention methods. And to know this all, we have accumulated leading experts from three different countries. These experts are of global acclaim, and I'm sure the audience will have full benefit from the voices that will come from these experts that we have. This also gives us a great opportunity to increase the awareness and um, focus on what is actually required. The World Hepatitis Day also celebrates and helps us refocus. We can celebrate on our successes and focus on the challenges that are still not met by the global community. This year, the theme for World Hepatitis Day is I can't wait. I can't wait because every 30 seconds, some person dies because of the illness related to hepatitis C. Without much ado, and uh, I can't wait to hear from the experts. First, I would like to invite and ask um, Dr. Aaron Homer to um, introduce himself, Dr. Homer. Mabuhay from the Philippines. I'm Dr. Ian Homerkua. I'm the head of the Institute of Digestive and Liver Diseases at St. Luke's Medical Center, Philippines. I'm also the concurrent uh, second vice president of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology and a past president of the Hepatology Society of the Philippines. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for being with us, uh, Dr. Dr. Homer. Next, uh, our um, uh, uh, expert, uh, Dr. Thunder. Professor Thunder, would you please introduce yourself? Ninglawa, I'm Thunder Tom from Myanmar. I'm now currently working in the Manila General Hospital, and also I work as a professor in the University of the Med Medicine, Mandalay. Thank you for inviting me. The next is Dr. Uh, Said Hamid. Dr. Said, would you please introduce yourself? Assalamu alaikum and good morning from, uh, from Karachi, Pakistan. I am a professor of medicine and gastroenterology at the Aga Khan University in uh, Karachi, having been involved with, with hepatitis C elimination for quite some time now. So real pleasure to be a part of this, of this important uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, all the experts um, from uh, different parts of the world. We will definitely going to learn a lot about um, hepatitis uh, and hepatitis C very, very uh, specifically. The format for today's dialogue is uh, mainly questions. We will be asking questions and, and um, the experts from across the three different countries would be answering uh, the, um, um, you know, those, those uh, questions. And uh, I think during this entire process, the entire audience will be benefited from uh, these, these common um, uh, questions that I would be uh, asking. Uh, I'll start off with um, uh, Professor uh, Ayn Homer. Um, uh, what is hepatitis and why we are um, celebrating or commemorating, refocusing on this, this disease? Yeah, so uh, basically World Hepatitis Day is one of the important um, uh, WHO Global Health Days. So this is being um, 
promoted by the WH and also uh, you have to remember that uh, the Southeast Asia carries a high incidence of hepatitis B. So uh, here in the Philippines, um, the celebration of the World Hepatitis Day has always been an opportunity to raise public awareness by conducting um, several activities for a number of years now. So this is to ra raise awareness with regards to the hepatitis B and hepatitis C. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Professor Tanda, um, uh, would you please just explain the audience like uh, how many types of uh, hepatitis are there? Uh, is there only one specific um uh, hepatitis that we all we should all be aware of or there are some other uh, types of uh, yeah there are many uh hepatitis virus causing the liver injury and uh, but uh, we common hepatitis viruses are hepatitis b and hepatitis c because these carry the the chronic liver diseases and then especially the our asian country we face many uh, liver diseases high in prevalence compared to the western country so uh, we mainly focus on chron uh, viral hepatitis which can cause the chronic uh, liver disease which is uh, hepatitis b and hepatitis c thank you all thank right you. um uh, professor said i'll um, have an, a question for you as well uh, would you please uh, let the let us uh, know and the audience know um, what is the uh, reason we are actually uh, focusing on hepatitis. Does it call a very serious illness? Uh, what happens to the patients? Well, uh, it does cause uh, both hepatitis B and C cause serious illnesses or can cause serious illnesses in a number of patients. So uh, let me put this in perspective. Uh, first of all, the the importance, the, the the heightened importance for this year's World Hepatitis Day is because of the fact, I think, that we are now coming out of the pandemic. So the past two years have been really uh, uh, have, have set back many programs, including uh, the viral hepatitis program in many countries. So I think the slogan uh, that we can't, the, the patients cannot wait anymore, any, nobody can wait anymore for refocusing on hepatitis, I think is an important one. So so that's the reason why this, this World Hepatitis Day is even more important than the previous ones that have gone through. Uh, your question about uh, why, uh, so again, if I put this into the perspective of Pakistan, for example, both hepatitis B and C cause roughly between 25 to 30,000 deaths per year, every year, right? For us, uh, uh, COVID has not been that bad a news as for many other countries. So COVID mortality in Pakistan is still less than 30,000 over the last two years. So, I mean, uh, the, the, we shouldn't be comparing diseases, I suppose, but just to put things in perspective for people, uh, viral hepatitis in Pakistan causes or has caused consistently more deaths than the pandemic itself. All right, and it does it also causes uh, liver cancer and other uh, related uh, untreatable uh, diseases once you have hepatitis C or B? Yes, so that is one of the reasons for mortality through liver cancer and 70% uh, of our liver cancer currently is due to hepatitis C. Uh, this cancer is the second highest cause for mortality all over the world in, 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 in cancer, in the cancer patients because it presents late and it is difficult to treat at that time or to cure the, 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 the cancer when people are presenting with this. All right, so thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Ayan Homer, um, what are uh, the reasons of uh, getting infected with hepatitis C? Would you please highlight a bit? Yeah, so we all know that hepatitis is a blood blood-borne virus so uh you have to remember the most cop in, in the philippines the most common route of transmission is through the use of iv drug use and um uh there's a small percentage that's being uh, transmitted uh, sexually 
but uh, here in the Philippines, there are certain areas where in there's a high number of uh, IV drug users. So uh, that's one of our priority areas for hepatitis C. All right, and uh, uh, Dr. Thunder, is the same, uh, uh, you know, reason so you, uh, hepatitis C spreads in your country or do you have uh, some other um, variables associated to it? Yeah, because uh, we are the Asian country, uh, um, hepatitis C in our country is uh, the prevalence rate is 2.7%. And among those uh, some uh, area like Ketchin State, uh, there are the, the uh, gold mine and then the jade mine. So very congested people. And then to, and in that area, very high rate of the peewit, uh, people who inject drugs. For those people, they have a high prevalence of the hepatitis C infection. And not only the hepatitis C infection, there is a co-infection with the HIV viral infection in, in these area, yeah. And another uh, mode of transmission in our country is a, a Buddhist monastery, and they have that some monks, they shave uh, the haircut monthly. And then for those uh, previous two decades, they use the same uh, uh, blade knives. But nowadays, we use uh, the disposable, so it can cut down the transmission compared to the previous decades. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Shahid, um, um, uh, uh, these two reasons are valid for Pakistan, or do you want to add some other reasons that hepatitis C also spreads uh, in uh, Pakistan, uh, maybe through blood transfusion or um, you know, uh, from uh, mother to child. Uh, do you have some other reasons in Pakistan, sir? So most importantly, Jazeb, as you know, uh, the the major reasons have been through healthcare, through poor healthcare practices, and that includes reuse of needles, syringes, uh, drips, injections, whatever, and also in many cases, blood that has not been actively uh, uh, tested for hepatitis C. Uh, but just to bring up uh, or reiterate the point that Dr. Thunder has uh, talked about. Uh, I think we also now need to start focusing on what we call these special groups, which are the people with injection drug users. As she has mentioned, 90% uh, uh, of our injection drug, drug users who are HIV positive are also hepatitis C positive. So it's a it's a huge issue. And, and these people get reinfected frequently. Their numbers are increasing our HIV population seems to be increasing. So I think these are now uh, uh, special groups that we need to focus on more and more. Thank you. All right, sir. So these are the areas, we, these are the people and the areas of high risk areas. Uh, uh, for the lay public, uh, do you think that there are other areas, uh, Dr. Homer? Um, for example, maybe, you know, using a same toothbrush or some household utilities that can spread. So do you think for the uh, uh, public, uh, they also need to understand uh, other reasons? Uh, Dr. Homer. Yeah, so uh, through the other route of transmission, it can also be from mother to child transmission, but it's a very low percentage. And then uh, sharing of um, Toothbrushes is not known to be, you know, to transmit hepatitis C unless they use the same uh, shaving equipment. So I and also we have to remember some may have like uh, dental practices if they don't, um, you know, um, do hygienic uh, practices. Sometimes it can also uh, lead to hepatitis C infection. All right, you're saying that the unsterilized products during dental practice, if it is used often to many patients, that could be one of the big reasons for, for uh, spread of it. Um, uh, Dr. Thunder, uh, Dr. Shaikh just mentioned about uh, reinfection. So um, is it uh, very alarming? Uh, it happens in despite of the uh, drug treatments. Uh, well, what do you have to say on this? Uh, yeah, mostly um, the HIV, uh, PWID, and 
people group is governed by the uh, the other NGO group, but uh, we, with the help of us, and then there is a the, the, those people they couldn't uh, give up the the um, the drug usage for those um, people they they come with with the reinfection. So another thing is a husband and wife. This is very low uh, low percentage, but uh, the wife is a cure, but um, they miss the the treatment for the husband. For those situations, then the wife came with the reinfection. But there is a uh, this is a low uh, percentage, but high percentage of reinfection is mostly we have seen in the PWID group. They didn't give up the the, um, the uh, drug analysis. Yeah. Thank you. All right, all right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Shade, um, let's say uh, someone has ac uh, acquired hepatitis C. A uh, patient. What are the early signs of this, uh, so they can seek help uh, quickly at uh, the appropriate place? So that's the issue, uh, Dr. Janzeb. There are no really significant early signs. That there are acute hepatitis C is very uncommon, uh, and therefore the presentation is generally something which is very indolent. Uh, people get the infection; they uh, continue to harbor it in most cases and they do not exhibit uh, significant symptoms quite often uh, to in order so that they may seek health care and therefore many many of these patients are just recognized if you screen them uh, or if they are uh, tested for any other reason uh, that's why they come through so that's why the the, the, the infection has often been called uh, the silent killer because the initial years of the infection are very silent until uh, patients then come and uh, come to the hospital or to healthcare facilities uh, with significant disease. Uh, so that's an issue. All right, uh, Dr. Homer, so once the patient is uh, done with the acute infection and now it's become chronic, so what, uh, what early signs that patient can have? Does it also let us know, does it take how many years to develop these, uh, these uh, symptoms or signs? So based on the natural history, so it goes into stages like uh, after acute hepatitis uh, C, patients will develop uh, most of the time around 70% of chronic hepatitis C. And then almost like 25% of this patient in 20 years time without treatment, uh, this patient may develop um, liver uh, cirrhosis and then around two, three percent of them will go into the compensation and to and around one to four percent of them will have liver cancer if they are not being treated. So it's so important for us as clinicians because if you look at the cascade of care for patients with hepatitis C, so most of the patient remains to be undiagnosed and then there's also a problem with uh, linkage to care and also the accessibility to the to the treatment. All right, um, uh, Professor Thunder. Um, uh, now uh, let's consider the patient has uh, in a patient's journey where the patient has a chronic hepatitis. So, what are the treatment options that the patient has? Uh, can you can you uh, highlight it? Yeah, since a uh, patient is a chronic uh, uh, hepatitis C infection, we diagnose as a chronic hepatitis C with the detectable viral RNA. Uh, any stage of the liver disease, we started to consider uh, to take uh, the treatment. And uh, normally, there are um, the, we can assess the very effective direct acting antiviral. So, uh, so we encourage to start the uh, to take the treatment. And uh, we our our country we have the GI liver societies and the simplified we. There is a guideline we developed and then regularly updated. So uh, available DAA and uh, available antiviral medications, we uh, we have the Sophos, Sophos and the Velbo and then the Sophos and Degler combination. So if whether a patient is affordable based on that, um, so uh, we started the treatment. Um, we encourage not only the hepatologist and we uh, other the generalist and the GP, and then we 
um, we uh, did the health education talk and then the simplified guidelines. So, so that's why because of the limited uh, hepatologists in our center, so uh, the special cases like the renal problem, advanced uh, cirrhosis of the liver. So those cases uh, we uh, monitored and we looked after. But simple cases like chronic hepatitis C, non serotic patients, and then a general practitioner, they cover the they took treatment, they uh, uh, look after the patients. And then our available in DAA is uh, two regimens, uh, Sophos Felt combinations and the Sophos Degler combination in Myanmar currently. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Shahid, uh, do we have uh, these same drugs available in Pakistan? Yes, that's correct. We have the same combinations uh, of soft DAC and soft uh, Velpatosphere uh, available right now. Uh, and uh, we mostly end up using uh, soft DAC uh, or soft Vel in, in, in patients uh, who need this. All right. And uh, sir, w what is uh, the, uh, uh, the treatment healing rate or success rate with this? Uh, will we are uh, able to uh, completely eradicate once the patient is on, on the therapy? Yeah, so these are highly effective drugs, as has been mentioned, um, in uh, uh, uncomplicated patients, which means that they don't have uh, cirrhosis and do not have any significant comorbids. You can expect upward of 95% of response, sometimes even higher. Uh, in patients who do have cirrhosis or have developed cirrhosis by the time they come to treatment, the, the response rates may be a little bit lower, but not all that all that low. Uh, certainly above 90% or between 90 to 95%. Uh, the good thing about these drugs is, are that these are these are uh, what are called pan-genotypic drugs, so they work across all genotypes. As you know, we are a genotype-free country, largely about 80, even 90% of our patients are genotype-free patients. And therefore, there was some concern that these drugs may not work as well because genotype-3 has been considered to be a difficult to treat genotype, but the results are uh, uh, absolutely fantastic or uh, almost exactly the same as in any other genotype. So these are truly pan-genotypic drugs. Great. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Homer, uh, we have uh, the same drugs in Philippines uh, available and the same successes with the drugs? Yeah. So. Uh, we have the, the combination of soft bell and soft lactatosphere in the Philippines. And then uh, I'd like to share with you, uh, we had a uh, memorandum coming from our Department of Health wherein they released interim guidelines in the management of patients with chronic hepatitis C. So they specifically um, mentioned that the assessment prior to the treatment and what are the treatment options for our patients. So I think we have the same uh, combination pangenotypic uh, medications for both Pakistan and also in Myanmar. And uh, we launched a, a program wherein it's piggyback with the HIV hub. So we launched this program uh, in Cebu wherein there's the highest incidence of hepatitis C. And then based on our data from uh, year 2020, almost like 400 um, patients were included in the program we're in. They can have uh, free access to treatment and most of them uh, completed the treatment only out of the 400, only like three or four patients uh, died because of the complications of their liver disease. And if the success rate, the SVR is almost like 98%. So hopefully, uh, with with the pandemic uh, almost um, almost like ending, hopefully we can continue this to the other parts of the Philippines. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Thunder. Um, uh, since uh, uh, all three countries have the drugs uh, effective drugs available, um, uh, do you uh, see uh, challenges in the compliance? And how long does the patient has to take these these uh, these drugs? So, uh, as I've mentioned, these uh, medications very highly effective. So, bell combination without the cirrhosis, without the fibrosis, is uh, twelve weeks medications um, can get the very Im impressive uh, cure rate. We call it the SVR. If patient has um, the cirrhotic uh, patient and the advanced fibrosis, we need to add the ribavirin. 
and to um, get a higher SVR rate. As uh, mentioned, some patients like uh, some comorbid like diabetes patients and then the, and the um, genome three. But we currently we didn't didn't uh, test the um, the genotype because uh, as Professor mentions, all the pan genotyping, but. Some patients are very uh, hard to, um, difficult to treat patients. So for those patients, uh, we have to treat a retreatment. So those patients, uh, we when we assess the genotype, uh, most patients uh, we found out to be the geno three, and then uh, compliant is uh, when we uh, consult is quite okay. But another problem is a co medication like uh, other medications. So uh, that's. That's the reasons, and we have to ask the the patients uh, the compliance as well as not uh, comply with the other medication to interfere the 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 efficacy of the these DA medications like uh, the protein binding and enzyme inducers for 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 uh, those patients we have to highlight uh, um, stress and mention the stressfully to get uh, we are. Uh, the the high SVR rate we call it a cure rate. Thank you. All right, all right, uh, Professor Say, um, uh, do we have a good compliance of the of the patients taking these antivirals? Uh, and how long is the treatment for hepatitis C with these combination drugs that you just mentioned? So um, uh, first of all, compliance uh, is is generally very very good, simply because this, uh, uh, apart from these drugs being very very effective, uh, they there are very little side effects. So uh, uh, hardly patients need to stop these medications for any significant side effects. So therefore, compliance is generally very good. Of course, uh, we need to keep continue to motivate motivate our patients when we see them in our clinics and so on. Uh, so that they are 100% compliant. As has been mentioned, there is there are some differences in the treatment uh, variety and the treatment duration, uh, depending on cirrhosis. So, for example, if you're using soft DAC, uh, 12 weeks is sufficient without ribavirin in patients who do not have cirrhosis. But in patients who do have cirrhosis, you sometimes need to, well, you, you need to increase the, the length of treatment to 24 weeks. And especially if these patients have failed treatment, you may need to add in ribavirin. That's when we, that's the only time when we use ribavirin when patients have failed previous therapy. Similarly, for soft well, if if uh, cirrhosis is present or not present, it's easier. It's both 12 weeks for uncomplicated cirrhosis. But if this is advanced cirrhosis or decompensation, then you need to go up to 16 weeks with the with the uh, soft well. But the good thing uh, is that. Um, uh, WHO uh, guidelines have promoted uh, significantly simplified measures to, to 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 you know to deal with these situations, and these are now non-invasive testing that is promoted. Uh, so, for example, there are various scores called APRI and FIB4 uh, that can be done uh, uh, with reasonable sensitivity to figure out whether patients have cirrhosis or not without going into things like fibro scans and even liver biopsies that we used to do so frequently many many years ago in these patients uh, so so there has been a lot of improvement in the way we handle these patients that ensures uh, compliance i think with, with these therapies right sir uh, that's a great news um, uh, high compliance oral drugs and a very high success rate uh, dr homer um, there were days where we uh, used to have a, a, a technology which it was injectable. So how different uh, do, does it really help the uh, the newer therapies, new products? Um, has really helped uh, these uh, patients or you see a similar effects? So with the new uh, oral DAAs, the pungent regimen, so most of our patients are quite compliant because uh, there's a combination uh uh, you know, pill. So it's they need to take it like once a day. So we have we see a lot of patients are highly compliant with the medications, and also they don't have um, any uh, side effects as compared to the era wherein they we started using pegylate interferon and ribavirin. We're in we see a lot of patients uh, developing uh, side effects to the medications. But if you compare now 
uh, the success rate is high, and then there's also good compliance with the new uh, budget typic regimen. All right. Um, I, I'll now uh, move to uh, another set of questions that many people usually ask or, and inquire. Uh, my question would be uh, to Professor Thunder. Um, screening, how uh, how it is done and and uh, how uh, correct is the, the screening methods that we currently have? Right. Um, the hospital setting, uh, the every patient who attend the, the liver clinic, we check the serological markers for both hepatitis B and C. But, uh, but yearly screening method, we couldn't practice uh, so far. But institution and Buddhist monastery and then the, um, the campaign, uh, we screen in the mass screening. But now today, the before uh, uh, the joining the university, before joining the, the, the job opportunity, they have to screen all um, the serological markers for both hepatitis B and C. And then uh, the clinic, uh, the private sector's clinic, uh, the package checking of the medical checkup, and then they also included the the serological markers for hepatitis B and C as we have the high prevalence of the viral hepatitis in our country. Thank you. Is it, is it expensive to screen? Um, how is the method? Uh, it's uh, quick results or it takes days to uh, bring in? No. Uh, so point, yeah, just screening is a point of care and then the screening test strip, test, uh, test strip and then the, the within the, uh, the, within the, the half days we can come up to, um, in, with the results and then after screening method it's and then we have to confirm with the the alizamid enzyme in the solvent assay and then that's uh, double and confirm with the alizamid method and then we pro, uh, proceed the the rna by the pcr method the screening test is not expensive and point of care and then just institution and then the group uh, the the suddenly that we can uh, um, say the test positive negative and then center unfortunately invalid result but we need to the confirm with the alisa method yeah thank you all right uh professor said uh in pakistan uh we have uh, hepatitis uh, um you know strategy to eliminate hepatitis uh, at a national level i'm sure other countries would also have the same and screening is one of the important tools there. So how effective it is to uh, screen out uh, individuals and put them on, on treatment, is it really effective, uh, the working for Pakistan? Yeah, so uh, our strategy uh, sh suggests uh, that we screen all. Uh, at least once we screen everybody above the age of 12 which for us will be in something like 150 million people to be screened at least once. Uh, but uh, as has been mentioned, these screening tests are very cheap, especially the ones what we use uh, in, in population at the population levels, which are the rapid tests. <coughs> as they, 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 they cost uh, for us at the moment uh, less than a dollar, for example. So it is very, cost efficient uh, to screen everybody in our population because we have a high prevalence of hepatitis C infection as we know uh, in our country. Uh, these tests are, are, are very good with high sensitivity and specificity. The only thing is that there are so many tests available on the market that uh, it would be my it will be our suggestion uh, and we suggest this in our guidelines as well that those tests should be used that are at least WHO pre-qualified, or if not WHO pre-qualified, at least <clears throat> have approvals from stringent, uh, stringent authorities, for example, uh, CE marked or uh, from FDA, etc. Uh, that will ensure uh, quality and, and, and the uh, preciseness of these tests. Um, uh, Professor Homer, uh, do we uh, in Philippines do we have uh, such a program uh, from the government 
where yeah, there is a mass screening and, and trying to identify people with uh, hepatitis C so they can be offered treatment? Yeah, so uh, you have to remember uh, the Philippines is highly endemic for hepatitis B. Almost like one out of, one of, out of eight Filipinos are infected with hepatitis B. So on the other hand, for hepatitis C, we have a low prevalence. So it's estimated about uh, 0.6% of the population. So we don't have a massive uh, screening at a certain age group as compared to Pakistan. So we only uh, screen patients if they have some risk factors. So we have a an interim guidance coming from the government wherein they recommend that if you have the risk factors, you can have the uh, anti-HGV, antibody testing, whether using a very uh, not so expensive rapid tests or laboratory-based uh, immune assay. So we follow this algorithm. If it turned out to be positive, so the patient will now have an HGV and A, uh, which is more expensive uh, compared to the screening test. So once we've proven this patient uh, that the patient has hepatitis C, so we have to discuss the patient on starting treatment. So as mentioned by Professor uh, Hamid, so we need to assess the liver fibrosis, whether the APRI fee for determine if there's cirrhosis. And you also need to discuss the patient uh, on the consideration for treatment, whether the patient has comorbidities preg or pregnancy or potential drug and interaction. So we follow the these guidelines when to start treatment, whether this patient has cirrhosis, without cirrhosis, whether it's compensated or decompensated cirrhosis, and also we monitor them while on treatment. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor uh, Thunder, um, we have uh, vaccines for hepatitis B, but we do not have vaccine. Do we have vaccine for hepatitis C? We do not have a vaccine for hepatitis C. No, we don't have any any news uh, for uh, any any updates or any news that you think that uh, when because that's the best way to prevent prevention is the best way so uh, any any thoughts on this um, as far as i know they are still in investigations whether or not and come out in the market so so am i right to professor hamid and the dr uma I think there is work going on, but I think people are being a little secretive in what they're doing. So they do not often present their work in clinical conferences and so on and so forth. Um, but there is certainly work going on in the, in the, for, a, for a hepatitis C vaccine. Uh, there have been various difficulties, mainly because of the heterogeneity of the virus. As we know, uh, it has a number of mutations, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, it has been difficult to produce a vaccine which is which works across all the genotypes. Uh, so let's see what happens. Uh, since the, the, such effective treatments have developed, people have taken up the slogan that treat your way out of this infection uh, rather than rather than prevent it with vaccines. But I think there will always be a place uh, for vaccinations, particularly when we talk about reinfections in those groups which are highly vulnerable to, to reinfections. All right. Um, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ian Homer, uh, you just mentioned that you have high in your country, you have high prevalence of uh, hepatitis B, and but not for C. So what is, uh, why it has happened, uh, how it is, uh, you know, uh, what's the reason for this? Yeah, so we all know that uh, hepatitis is also a bloodborne virus. So the most common route of transmission here in the Philippines is uh, from mother to child transmission and also sexual transmitted. So based on our data, uh, most of the patient uh, develop chronic hepatitis B because there's a low uh, rates of uh, hepatitis B immunization way back uh, 20, 30 years ago. So that's the reason why we see a lot of chronic hepatitis B patients. But in recent years, the the success rate of the birth dose vaccination uh, is increasing, and hopefully we can uh, be at par in year 2030. Uh, where we have to eliminate uh, hepatitis B and also hepatitis C. Um, all right. So uh, despite of uh, 
uh, newer therapies, despite of uh, celebrating these days and uh, uh, despite of our targets uh, given to us and national different programs, we are still not able to uh, eliminate um, hepatitis and uh, hepatitis C as well. So uh, my question would be to Professor Thunder and then, and then I'll ask the same question to the other uh, panelists is, are we moving in the right direction or not? Are we going to, uh, are we going to uh, eliminate new infections by 90% as per WHO by 2030 uh, in your country? Um, but this indications are positive. Do you think that in your country you're able to uh, uh, do this? Yeah, our national strategies um, we aimed at fifty percent of the hepatitis C diagnosed in the twenty thirty and fifty percent um, of the patient treated already treated in twenty thirty. Uh, this is uh, we aim in the before pan um, pandemic era. Um, after that, uh, we um, we have uh, current situations. I think uh, we have to try very very hard to get uh, these goals. But uh, before uh, national plan uh, 2017 and 18, uh, we aim that 50% uh, diagnosis 2030 and 50% of the people uh, must be treated in 2030. This is our aim. But now day by day, um. I feel that we have to just uh, feel that we are moving the right direction. Thank you. Right. Professor Said, uh, same question. Are you moving in the right direction? Uh, how, uh, how confident you are that we would be able to um, achieve our targets by 2030? Yeah, we are moving in some direction, but we are not moving with that, that much speed. So a recent uh, WHO report suggests that there's only a handful of countries across the globe which will eliminate by 2030. And of course, guess what? Most of those countries are those that are smaller in size and those that have a lot of money. They're wealthy countries. Uh, none of the lower middle income countries or even the middle income countries are on course to eliminate by 2030. Most of us, uh, if, we, if we go along the same way, will not eliminate before 2050. So there is a real urgency to do this. And it has been shown that it can be done in a concentrated effort. For example, Egypt they, they did this within five years, let's say. Uh, the only difference is the political will. I think uh, very few countries exhibit the same political will that some countries that are able to eliminate quickly. And that includes places like Georgia, Rwanda in, the, in, in Africa and so on. Uh, uh, very, very few countries demonstrate that political will and commitment uh, to eliminate hepatitis C, which is a shame because I think we've got all the tools that will eliminate hepatitis C very quickly and efficiently if we put our efforts, our full scale efforts into this. And uh, our, our uh, research and many other researchers have shown that these are highly cost-effective public health interventions. So for example, for Pakistan, if we spend a dollar today, we will be saving $3 uh, per person by the end of, by the end of uh, 2030. In other words, uh, there'll be less deaths, there'll be less cancers, there'll be less sp expenditure on treating people with their end-stage liver diseases and everything, liver transplants and whatnot, and there will be increased productivity. So the arguments for treating this infection uh, on a kind of a war footing is uh, are all of them are there. Somebody just has have to act on those uh, on those. Uh, 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 in an emergency manner, and this will be done. Thank you. Right, sir. So uh, it's important uh, political will, uh, governance, the leadership, and putting the, the disease on the agenda list, you know, that would be an important element to eliminate uh, any any disease. So, um, uh, Dr. Homer, um, uh, how uh, confident you are that you're going to hit the country's objectives, and what, what, is your, what are your feelings? So, 
are we on track uh, to the viral hepatitis elimination? So I totally agree with both our uh, speakers. Uh, number one issue, uh, it's uh, the funding commitments remain to be inadequate to meet the global goals because of the COVID-19 response for the past uh, two and a half years. She also need to remember that for hepatitis B, timely access to birth dose hepatitis B vaccine remains low in many uh, low and middle income countries. 80% of patients with hepatitis B or C remains undiagnosed. And then also uh, affordable treatments are not being uh, are not being accessed and hepatitis B and C together continue to cause more than 1 million deaths per year as a result of the chronic liver disease and cancer. And then how do we address this problem. So we need to look into the public health perspective with regards to the key strat uh, strategic and operational shift. We need to promote a uh, greater public and political awareness. We have to allocate increased uh, financial resources to viral hepatitis B and C. We have to scale up access to hepatitis B birth dose vaccine and testing for pregnant women and ensure continued investment in primary prevention and substantially increase access to hepatitis B and C testing and treatment. We also need to build on existing community and health facility-based services, promote simplified uh, service delivery models that include decentralization of the testing and also most importantly we need to strengthen the community and the civil society engagement and the innovative partnership so we can do this together all right sir. thank you very much for your thoughts uh professor thunder do we have uh, outreach programs in your uh country where the vulnerable population or high-risk population or those who are um, underprivileged have access to uh, the uh, treatments, uh, the healthcare overall? Uh, yeah, uh, before pandemic, and we have some uh, current situa situations, and then before that, uh, we have the some uh not only the public and then the um private and then uh, with the help of the bernard institute and then msf Myanmar, for those uh, ngo uh, organizations and then they um they help in the pivot population and then uh, some institution we involved to uh the high risk uh, to cure the to find out screening monitoring and and treatment for the um, the high risk population, and then uh, uh, Dr. Homer mentioned at the uh, immunization program to cut uh, for regarding the hepatitis B to cut mother to child transmission. We have the the we com uh, collaborate with the uh, obstructive and kindly teams, and then but uh, nowadays we have uh, the the these speed is uh, cut off because of the pandemic. Uh, disease and then the current situation but now we started to uh, move all right sir. uh professor yeah, said thank, um, thank you very much professor said uh do you have any outreach programs at the university or the, at the government or private level where the vulnerable communities um high-risk communities or those who can't afford don't do those who do not have access to uh, treatments and the physicians all the healthcare um are getting benefited Yes, so apart from uh, what the government programs do, uh, which quite often uh, uh, do not work as efficiently, uh, what we do as a private university, we do two things. One, uh, we engage in what are, what is called micro-elimination. So we have a number of micro-elimination campaigns. What that means is that we target a population which we know has high prevalence we go into that population, we, we uh, establish ourselves there for a year or so, and we try and test and treat as many, if not the entire population of that of that area. So we have some work going on in Malir in a few of the union councils in Malir, which is a which is a urban, peri-urban, rural area next to Karachi. 
The other thing that we're doing is that we have a number of outreach uh, uh, clinics uh, from our university spread across the whole of the country in which we have started to um, uh, we've, we've developed a campaign along with our other partners, including GETS, which we where we are able to uh, screen and treat patients, uh, particularly those patients who are uh, who are below the poverty line and cannot afford any treatment. Uh, and as, so we are reaching out to them uh, out in the communities, out in the per peripheries uh, to try and get them uh, treated and uh, into the mainstream as well. Uh, so those are just a couple of initiatives uh, that we are uh, that we are engaged in, uh, and I think these these are important uh, to support the government programs because this is such a large burden for us that the government alone cannot do this, and they they recognize it, and therefore uh, these the, these uh, public private partnerships are important. These private private partnerships are extremely important uh, to keep moving forward. Thank you. All right, sir. Um, uh, Dr. Homer, same question for you, sir. Do we have outreach yeah, programs yeah. in the Philippine communities? Yeah, so in the Philippines, uh, our local society, the Hepatology Society of the Philippines, is the lead national uh, society in the study and care of liver disease, liver health and disease among Filipino patients. So the HSP is so active in promoting uh, comprehensive information to the public as well as to the medical community and also uh, it, it collaborates with the government in formulating in the liver related health policies so i would like to share with the group that uh the department of health came up with the administrative order way back in 2017 they look into the policy on the prevention and control of the viral hepatitis of the national hiv aids sci prevention and control program so in this particular uh, national action plan in way back uh, in 2019 we the HSP participated in the launching of the hepatitis B demonstration projects in different parts of the Philippines we're in. We provide um, free um, you know, diagnostic and also free medications to our hepatitis B and as well as hepatitis C patients. So with this particular demonstration project from the DOH, uh, they selected uh, several sites to evaluate the different models of hepatitis B assessment, treatment, and follow-up in public health care. So we have identified around five cities in the Philippines. So we have a uh, good success with this and hopefully um, Hopefully, when the, the COVID-19 pandemic will end, so it will, you know, cascade it to the different uh, local government units in the Philippines where um, it can be of help for our patients with hepatitis and hepatitis C. All right, so thank you very much for your thoughts. Um, this would be my last round of uh, question. The same, I will ask the same question from uh, all the panelists, uh, and then we will close with your messages uh, for the audience. Uh, Professor Thunder, my question is, uh, what are the top three things that you would focus to eliminate uh, hepatitis C from the country? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, now screening is important to find out who is the, the, the infected with the hepatitis C infection. And then the screening must, and then we have the accessibility of the medications. And uh, for, and then after that, and if they cure, then third is uh, if the cured patient has the, the, the free from the virus, they have to monitor to prevent the, the reinfections. And then uh, especially those patients who have uh, the cirrhotic patients, uh, since uh, cirrhosis with the hepatitis background, hepatitis C infection, we need to uh, monitor the hepatocellular carcinoma to not to change the ACC because in our country, the prevalence of hepatocellular carcinoma is high, uh, very high prevalence in the country. And then uh, we, 
we encourage those patients to, uh, to give the hepatitis B um, immunization as well as to avoid the alcohol and then indigenous medicines. So, so in management of the hepatitis C, we have to screen and then treat and then to prevent the monitor and to prevent the, uh, the decompensated uh, cirrhosis of the liver. All right. Thank you. Sir, uh, uh, your priorities would be different uh, than uh, uh, screen, treat, and monitor, Dr. Said? Yeah. So I'll just, I'll just add one thing to this, and that is educate, uh, screen, and treat. Um, uh, education, I think, is still critical uh, because even in a high prevalence country like Pakistan, you'd be surprised to know that a large number of people do not understand how badly or profoundly hepatitis C or B can affect them, their lives, their families, their their uh, their loved ones, uh, and therefore they, they, they never bother. Uh, and secondly, uh, it is also surprising that many of our uh, populations do not know uh, that there are such effective and such uh, sort of benign in terms of uh, side effects therapies that are available now to cure hepatitis C. There is still the impression out there that hepatitis B and C are incurable conditions, so why bother? Uh, so education, I think, is, is, is still critical, despite the fact that we've been doing it for so many years, it still is needed. And then, of course, we've talked at length about screening and then and then treating, and 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 that is where we don't don't have any issues. We just have issues of bringing these people into the net, which is the critical one. Thank you. All right, sir. Um, Dr. Homer, uh, screen, educate, screen, treat, monitor. That's the uh, you know uh, agenda topics, top priorities for the uh, first two panelists. You want to add something or you defer or agree? What's your comments on this? Yeah, so I totally agree with them. So it's very important that we have to enhance uh, patient awareness and uh, patient empowerment. It's so vital. So at the same time, we have to update and strengthen the capabilities of physicians in managing uh, liver disease uh, patients in the primary as well as the advanced care settings. It's very necessary. So all this hopefully will be translated to a more equitable clinical practice as we endeavor to maintain a close collaboration with the government institution and legisl legislators to ensure that good science translates to good and practical public policy. All right. So um, uh, at the end, it's like uh, uh, educate, uh, screen, treat, monitor, and advocacy, and also um, involve governments in their uh, showing their commitments and seeing um, and ensuring that they are there with us to eliminate hepatitis C. Um, to the audience, uh, again, um, we have uh, experts from three different countries of global acclimation. And uh, we are celebrating World Hepatitis Day today. Um, uh, now we are almost closing. And before just we close, I will request all the panelists just to share your message to the audience, uh, those who have been able to connect with us. Uh, Professor Thunder first, please. Uh, what could be your message for um, World Hepatitis Day? So this is a high time to uh, detect whether you have hepatitis, uh, have it or not, and then and uh, don't wait, start to see. Don't the, wait. That's an interesting one. Um, uh, Professor Said, what would be your message? Sir? So I think, uh, Janzeb, what we need to do in Pakistan and what is missing is to bring the patient into the, into the picture. Uh, we do not have any uh, uh, amount of patient inclusion into our uh, our uh, campaigns of, of World Hepatitis Days or whatever, and therefore they are unheard. I know and I've worked with the Yellow Warrior Society, for example, from the Philippines, and I know how dedicated uh, these, these people are. And they're all, I, I believe they're all Hepatitis B patients, uh, current or former or whatever, and how well they are able to influence policy uh, within their country. 
so we need to work very hard on, on on bringing those those patients into the picture which are entirely missing uh, at this moment in pakistan at least i don't know about uh, myanmar so all right um uh, dr homar what would be your message for the day so my message for everyone so we can't wait for a world without hepatitis so together we can make it happen all right sir thank you very much um, and now it's time to close and say goodbye but our commitments would remain high to eliminate uh, hepatitis c and hepatitis from from different parts of the world um, uh, amazing uh, dialogue uh, i've learned a lot obviously with the, all the experts that we have of gro global elimination with us and our audience say uh, there was very common questions that we usually get from the audience and i think these questions are fully addressed um, i thank you again to professor thunder professor said and um, uh, and dr homer from philippines for being with us and taking time out for such a education and information session today um, and to the audience uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us uh, and hope to see you again Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.